Cover me! Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to What's Important Now, the podcast from the United States Border Patrol Academy, where we talk about things that are important to the men and women of the United States Border Patrol and their families. Also talking about things that uh, the people that we serve may or may not be aware of. One of those things for me, I'm always fascinated with the type of people that I get to interact with and that put on this uniform, just some of the most amazing people I've ever had the chance to uh, to come across. And, and my guest today is absolutely in that category. He's somebody that uh, is known to a lot of people uh, as an actor, as an artist. He's uh, starred in the hit series, The Mayans. He's a, a, a successful writer, successful producer. But what you may not know, he's also a former Army Ranger, and he's also a former Border Patrol agent. And that is Mr. Vince Vargas. Vince, thanks for being here, man. <laughs> thanks for the invite. <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you, I'm a little bit starstruck right now. It's uh, I, I've watched Sons of Anarchy, and I've watched the uh, the Mayans, and, and I see you, and and uh, it's just it's like it's like talking to a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I, I'm, I admire you in the position you're in right now, and especially being at the the academy for me is a. I am a drill instructor in the Army as well of some part of my career, and I just appreciate that side of any kind of experience and, and watching the new trainees, I'm sure, is, is, is kind of awesome for you to see the beginning of where, where they come from and where they leave. Uh, and how much growth they have for everybody that, that leaves there. As far, as far as I'm concerned, I've got the best job in the Border Patrol. This is the, I don't know how you can not have fun being in this place here. I mean, it's 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 motivational, and you see everybody enthusiastic and sounding off. And and I've talked about it. matter of fact, I just had Manny Padilla, the, the yes. uh, chief of Liad. Uh, he, he was just here mentoring a class, and he talked about how, man, he just feel recharged and rejuvenated being here and seeing all this going on. Yeah. It, it, and I know we, we didn't even think about talking this, but for me, I mean, that was the beginning of a, an extreme life change. And for many of us on the bus driving to Artesia, it was that moment of like, man, I, I, this is the beginning of I made it. You know, that feeling of finding your place, and which is beautiful. Well, and you know this. So when you apply for well, a lot of federal jobs, man, you go through those steps. You say, okay, you do the, you hit the submit button on the application, and then you wait a few weeks, and then you get the next step, go to the doctor, and then you wait a few weeks, and you don't hear anything, and you wonder if they forgot about it, or lost your paperwork. Then you go have to take a PT test, and by the time you get in that bus or on that bus, it may be six or eight months that have passed by. Yes, yeah. For me, it was two years, and, oh. and there was a reason for that. I took the original test, I failed the test. And then as I had to wait three months to retest, uh, they revised the scoring and my score was now a passable score. So then they put me back into the hiring process. And then I had to go to drill sergeant school for the military. And so that put a pause on my hiring oh. and then I had to re-up it again. And so it took two years for me to finally get that that okay. But the process feels like it's, it's never ending. It, and it's also it almost feels like a lottery ticket. Like, man, I hope, I hope this is going to be it, you know, for your family, for yourself, you know, trying to find myself at that time, getting out of the military and just struggling was like, I just want to find that place that that's for me. And when you finally get that word, I remember they called like Eagle Pass, Texas. I said, yes, <laughs> where's that? <laughs> Didn't even let them finish. <laughs> I, I don't even know what that is, but yes, I'll, I'll go. And so, you know, it was just was the beginning of, of a, whole different chapter for me. Well, so for me, you know, I, I come from Oklahoma. A little town in Oklahoma is called Tahlequah. Most people can't even spell it, let alone find it. And it because I was 21 years old and really had never left home, you know, it, my background took about two seconds. So <laughs> when, I, when I got on the bus, they told me I was going to El Centro, California, and I had to open up one of those Rand McNally maps, you know, and I'm looking. Yeah. And I, I flew to Los Angeles, and then, of course, you hop on those little crop duster planes from Los Angeles to the Imperial Valley. And I'm yeah. looking down, and I, I, I think we're on Mars. You know, it just, it's completely different. And when we land, you know, it, it, it was November. And I remember calling back home and saying, hey, you know, this isn't bad. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's nice. We're in shorts. It's not snow on the ground. Fast forward, and I go back in, in April, and there was the oven turned on, 117 yes, in the shade. And so very big shock, but but worth every second. It was, yeah. Love that. So your first duty station was, was where? 
Yeah, it was Del, Del Rio sector. Uh, and Eagle, Pass. Eagle Pass. Okay. Eagle Pass North. And so um, there is two, they divided it. By the time I got there, they separated to two different uh, North and South, and I was part of the North. So you weren't anywhere near home, really, when you, uh, when you, when no. You so home at the time was Florence, Arizona. I got out of the military in 2007 and I jumped right into corrections right away. So I was a correction okay, officer yeah. for a private prison down in Florence, Tech, uh, Florence, Arizona. When I applied, I was hoping to get in Arizona. I keep hearing that, you know, the needs of the Border Patrol, they wanted more in Arizona. And then I get the call of Eagle Pass. Someone told me I can say no and they would give me a second option. Like, I was too afraid to say no. Me I said, too. Yep, whatever it is. Yep. And uh, I Googled it and they said, uh, you know, it's the home the home of the nachos or something like that. <laughs> and I was like, well, it looks like that's where I'm going. Well, and, and you're you're right because after you go through a, a two-year process, you don't want to roll the dice and have them maybe not offer you the job. So, yeah, you're going to take whatever they, uh, whatever they throw your way. Thankfully, I think Del Rio is a great sector and Eagle Pass is a great station. Yeah, it was great. It was it was a blessing, and you didn't realize uh, all the all the things that were in the area from San Antonio being a two hours away, Del Rio, Lake Amistad, all these things that I didn't realize like so valuable to me and, and, and my kids at the time, and it was just cool. So before you had the benefit of, of like I said, being in the army, and and even better than that, being a ranger with uh, uh, you know deployed multiple times. Uh, so you had that kind of experience, and you'd moved around. You kind of knew what that was all about. So that had to soften the blow uh, going into the Border Patrol. You knew a little bit about what to expect. Yeah, I actually, you know, I, I wasn't too nervous or afraid. I wasn't. I didn't feel like there was anything that was going to be too shocking for me, and, and there really wasn't. Um, you know, doing four years with 2nd and the 75th Ranger Regiment, that's that takes a toll. That's sure. that's heavy on the body. That's heavy on the family. That's just just all, all in all, it's just a, it's a running and gunning daily. To get out into the corrections world, I realized pretty fast uh, I wanted to shift gears and not do that. Mm-hmm. It's just one of those worlds that you either love it or you hate it. Um, I was doing special operations for the prison system, doing a lot of cell extractions and, and riot controls. And I was like, you know what? There's more to law enforcement in, in a space that I want to I want to go towards. And then uh, when I got into the Border Patrol, I just kind of knew that was the, the place for me. You know, I didn't even know about the Border Patrol originally. I've driven them. You know, we've gone to Mexico to... TJ and Rosarito biannually as a family. And I seen the Border Patrol vehicles and I guess you just acknowledge it, but don't really know in depth of what they do. And my dad's like, oh, there's a Border Patrol. I'm like, oh, cool. It's when they had those, you know, that mint green, you know, <laughs> sea foam green. Yeah. That's, that's what I started in. Yep. Yeah. And so I remember seeing it and uh, I didn't really take into account what they did or, or any value of it. It's just like, cool. It's just someone who's there. Right. When I was in the military in 2004, my first deployment uh, in Afghanistan, my squad leader at the time was talking about, he asked us all the question, what do we want to do when we get out? And uh, my father was a firefighter, 32 years, LA City. My brother, uh, you know, at the time he transitioned into corrections as well. And then it was jumping into the fire, fire department too. So I was like, yeah, I'd like to be in the fire department. You know, I'd love to figure that out. My dad did it. And it's just kind of a legacy thing. And he was talking about the border patrol and the special operations and it's a federal budget. And, you know, it's pretty much doing the same thing we do here, but in, in you know, and I was like, huh. Never even thought of that and, and completely shifted gears. When I got out, he was, he was, that squad leader, unfortunately was, was killed in 2006 and he was a big mentor and kind of a father figure for me. And he really was kind of a guiding light. And I respected him so much that that border patrol conversation stuck with me. And uh, I wanted to do my best to make him proud in, in, in the thing with a lot of veterans. And, and I know there's a lot of veterans serving now, probably have gone through very similar hardships where you lose someone and, and, and how do you make them proud, right? How do you, yeah. how do you handle the, the guilt that's in us sometimes that we just wish they were still with us? And, and you know, we're not, we're, we're trying to entertain our lives somehow and still with that in the back of our heads. I thought I wanted to live in the best light with, with him and, and try and live out his dream. And so I applied for the Border Patrol and, you know, I was blessed enough to, to make that in 2009 to the Academy. And that just, so... You come from a, a service family, you know, the family that uh, yeah. has absolutely as a first responder and in the military. And so that was the example that you kind of had set. And then you get into it and in, in serving in the military and the army. And you you make these close friends and family, you know, your brothers in arms. And, and yeah. you see tragedy happen, and, but you see people that you want to emulate. It's hard to put into words how that impacts a person and their character and, and how they proceed forward with life. It, no, exactly. I think... That was the first step of me dedicating myself to another service that serves our country, right? It was like, 
well, I can continue to do the same service I, I was providing in the military, but now on our own soil where I can be a better father, a better husband, you know, which was now becoming more of a valuable I- ideology for myself because I missed so much of their lives all those years. And so doing this, doing a very similar mission, but in country was, was like, yeah, this sounds like the right idea for me. And you start to realize, and, and for me, it happened uh, later in the career. Cause I missed a lot of things uh, with my kids as well. I have both kids serving in the armed forces, ones in the Navy, ones in the Air Force. And, and I think back to, you know, 9-11 and a few years thereafter and, and gone most of the time for about seven years. It was just yeah. one thing after the other. And, and it's important stuff. And it's things that you do because your country needs you to do it. But you're missing out on a lot with your family, yeah. the ones that really, really matter to you. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of us as fathers and mothers want to do the job justice and do and be good at the job because the job essentially affords us the freedom to just live a comfortable life. But then we also forget like when the job gets 100% of us, the family kind of gets the seconds and trying to balance that. I mean, it was impossible in my military career, but it was possible in the Border Patrol. And, and the problem was that I wasn't willing to accept that yet. And mm-hmm. so... I had to turn that dial on eventually. And, uh, you know, it's, to me, is the most valuable thing in, is having supervisors that kind of promoted that, like, hey, you have these days off for a reason, take them, you know, things like that. Yeah. And so when you have so many, when you're able to build up your, your days off uh, and using them in the way to, to really support your family, I, I, I've never seen anything like that. And the military didn't do that. <laughs> well, and, and that's an important message, I think, for, uh, for, the, for the younger folks that are coming into this organization, any law enforcement organization, in fact, is making that uh, making time for your family and and prioritizing your loved ones that's an active process that we have to engage in because it's really easy to get wrapped up in the importance of what we're doing and before you know it time flies and we've yeah. missed out on so much that really matters at the end of the day yeah that's correct i believe in that so let's let's talk back uh, you're back on the bus and you're headed to the uh, to the academy and you know you have this experience of having been in the army and been with the corrections and and so two years of effort is about to pay off talk us through what those emotions are like whenever you're pulling through the gates you know you want to put your best foot forward but because uh, i've been doing the military thing for so long i also kind of go by the code of try and be the gray man you yeah. know try and try and sit back you know don't stand out yeah, let other people volunteer and, and just, just just do your thing, right? Um, get off the bus and, you know, at this time, remember, I did four years active duty as an infantryman in 2nd Ranger Battalion with three combat deployments, a lot of leadership abilities already, and then I've already been a drill sergeant for the United States Army for multiple years. So I get off the bus and they're like, farm it up, who's military, you don't get in a formation, you know, the, the paramilitary, you know, yep. get off the bus, kind of shark attack thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm not volunteering for anything. I'm just like, nope. I'm like, just get information. And I'm watching, you know, I'm watching these guys trying to figure it out. And I'm just like, dude, just stand there. Don't don't bring attention to yourself. And finally, they're like, who's military? Raise your hand. Didn't raise my hand. I'm like, oh, you didn't. Okay. I was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing like, it's an integrity check of your military. Raise your hand. I'm like, oh, man. Boom. And so Uh like six of us raise our hands. And they started asking everyone's job in the military. And, uh. One guy was a cook. Like, a cook? Oh, my, get up here. And boom, they made him one of the class <laughs> leaders. And then they asked me, and I told him, a drill sergeant. And then they were like, yeah, get up here. And so it didn't take long for me to be in front of the formation, um, taking charge of everybody and trying to get them, you know, suited and booted, you know, spit and shined and, and ready to rock. And so it was very familiar. It actually kind of was almost too familiar. It was fun. I, mm-hmm. I, right away, I kind of fit in and... And I think a lot of guys who are military, men and women who are military, will will kind of enjoy the the you know the paramilitary style. It's not over the top like like we had to deal with, but it is there, and, it, and it, I think it brings familiarity to it. Well, and I I gotta believe that that your classmates benefit from that experience by having you out front. You can kind of guide them through that. Yeah, you know, I remember sitting there teaching guys how to spit shine their boots and, and showing people how to iron, you know, and it mm. was so familiar for me being in basic training and having to take care of the guy in the left and the right of me. And so, you know, I think they benefited from it. And, and I think I benefited from it just as much, you know, it was, it was nice to, to humble myself down a little bit and, and, and get back to the kind of the roots of 
building that camaraderie, building that teamwork. Well, and, and like like the military, I mean, you have people from all walks of life that are showing up on that bus with you from all corners of the country and everything. Like you said, from from cooks to people that are that have law degrees, to people that were police officers, to people that are combat veterans. You know, I, I'm thinking some of the things that uh, the, these folks that just graduated today, very diverse backgrounds in their own right. And, and some of them are like, how did you find the Border Patrol and what in the world made you sign up? Yeah. Uh, one of my 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 roommate, he was a non-drafted free agent uh, for the NFL and the Minnesota Vikings. He was a mm-hmm. linebacker. This dude showed up at 260 with no neck. <laughs> By the time he left the academy, he was 235, ripped and shredded, you know. And he's from Michigan. So it's one of my best friends still to this day. And mm-hmm. it was just funny to hear our stories and how the parallels between them, you know, and how much, you know, we helped each other through academy, through studying. And we now will forever be best of friends from the experience from the academy. And that's a great point because we talk about people that come in here and we say, you have no idea how close of a bond you're going to have with your classmates and even more so the men and women that you're going to work beside out there in the field. It it, it transcends any school age friend or or people back in your hometown because of what you share and the things you do together. That in and of itself makes doing a job like this worthwhile. Oh, for sure. I mean, we've, we went to Boar Star Academy together as well, the selection, and it was just that guy I knew I could count on. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I'd be venting to, or we'd be sitting there, you know, eating our meals, whatnot, licking our wounds from the day yep. of selection. Mm-hmm. And um, if it wasn't for him being there, I think the morale would have been a lot less, you know, and so mm-hmm. you don't realize the people you work with now, you'll forever be connected to. Yep. And at the academy, you talk about getting off the bus and the, the shark attack, the, the stress inoculation. So yep. you'll see people on social media commenting, you know, why have that or trying to be like the military. But there's a necessary uh, portion of that. There's a reason why we do it. You having been a drill instructor, having been in the military and in federal law enforcement. So tell everybody what that does for uh, a basic training like this. Yeah, it's very important to strip everyone down of what their belief systems are and their own ideologies and, and get acclimated to what the Border Patrol's goal here is. It's it's a team effort. It's a community. It's a brotherhood. And creating stress like that, one, gets people to think in a stressful situation. Our job can be stressful. And two, is get them to fall in line with the unit, right? We have we have to be a cohesive unit when we go there and work. We're going to work our areas. We're going to do them well. And then we're going to work together when someone calls for assistance. And so in an academy scenario like that, it is very important to, to induce stress. It's very, how do you know your brothers, to the left and, your brothers and sisters to the left and right of you are going to be able to do that job in the moment's notice when you see an IA who's potentially drowning? You guys are going to come together and work together and find a way to rescue them. There's a million different uh, variables to that. And the only way that we know that your willingness to be put through that stressful decision-making process is to put you through that in a non-stressful environment. And the only way you can conduct stress is yelling louder and impossible time hacks, right? These, these things that you do as an instructor make it very hard for them so they can start learning how to think on the go and think in a stressful scenario. And that, so well put, and, and, and that actually describes the rationale why. And, and contrary to belief, it's not it's not about getting out there and having fun at somebody else's expense, you know, and enjoy yelling at somebody or anything like that. What a lot of folks don't realize, at least here, that's a very choreographed and controlled environment that we move oh, yeah. folks through. It's not, it, it feels chaotic to the person going through it, but... They're being taken care of, and it's uh, they're being moved in a purpose on a very strict timeline towards an objective. There's always a training purpose behind everything that happens at a basic training like this. Oh, definitely. You know, some of my buddies were, were PT instructors out there, and those are the nicest guys you'll ever meet. But what you know them as is as training is <laughs> the scariest dude in the room. You know, yep. like they got their machines. You know, but um, there is genuinely those guys, those men and women who are PT instructors who, who are going to be the most stressful guys in the room. Those in your, your farm instructors will be pretty stern. But your PT instructors, they know their intention. You know, their job is to get you ready for the field. This is not the safest job in the world. We have lost agents out there. And they carry that with them every time someone comes in who's new and, and wants to do this job. Well, you have to know the gravity of this job. And those instructors will forever know your name. And if for some reason something unfortunate happens, they're always going to question whether they gave you their all. Yep. And and I do that as a drill instructor, sending guys to Iraq and Afghanistan. Like my fear is that I didn't give them enough, and so they're passionate about their job because they know what they're about to get into. And it's almost like 
your father looking down at your, your son and saying, I'm going to try and train you the best possible because you're going to face the world. And I might seem like a jerk, but it's just tough love. Yep. And that's what I genuinely believe is going on at the academy. I do, too. And, and I, of course, I get to see it firsthand. I actually know these instructors at, at a personal level like you did, and, and you see what they are in real life. And at, they're here instructing because they care. I mean, they, they, right. they want to have that impact, and I think that speaks volumes for them as well. So for the, the group that is, we have about a third of our population that is veteran. Why yeah. would somebody that has served in the military want to look for a job like the Border Patrol? What is that? What, what benefit is it for them? It is... A very similar. I don't know if you'll ever be able to match the camaraderie from the military, especially going overseas. You know, that's a very, that's a very man. It creates bonds that last forever. But I think yeah. the border patrol is, is second to that. This is a, a very similar feel. You know, the the camaraderie, the brotherhood, the 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 brotherhood sisterhood, right? The the challenges, the stress, the teamwork. All these things are very similar. And so I imagine. Any veteran that comes into the Border Patrol are going to find a second home, right? They're going to find their new identity uh, and a new mission. And that's very important. That's valuable to to someone who, guys who get out and struggle, right? There's a lot of guys who get out and struggle, and I believe it's because they get stagnant. They don't have a new mission. And so I think the best thing a veteran could do is join the Border Patrol. When they find the Border Patrol, they'll be like, wow, this, there's so many parallels from the military to, to the Border Patrol. It's why I was so addicted to it and why I was so drawn into it and why I every day wake up and wish I was putting back on that uniform because um, there's something so familiar with the military. And as well as, you know, you, you do get paid for the hours you work, which is different, right? Which is, <laughs> Than the military. Valuable. Yeah, which okay. is valuable because yep. it really is important to know that financially you can support your family with the hard work that and efforts that you're making. There's the... I love the other side of the border where most people probably don't talk about and probably don't know is that there's so many different avenues you can take once you're done with your two years. Yep. You can go special operations, right? You can be a board star agent like I was, or you can go Intel. You can go all these different directions that break up this monotony of a job that's, that's that, you know, I got to do this job for 30 years. Yeah, but how cool is that you can change jobs every couple of years to something new? How many times did you find yourself saying, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this? That, that was my whole. That was my whole career. Yeah, I mean, it just <laughs> never stopped. I tell the trainees, I, it, if you get bored in the border patrol, you're not trying. There is something yeah. out there for everybody. You named off just a few. They have people that gravitate towards all sorts of things. Everything. Peer support, the veteran support program, chaplaincy, pipes and drums, honor guard, intel, training, recruiting. You can go. You can be in a data analysis. You can intel, special operations, maritime, horse patrol, ATV. These are just off the top of my head. PAO. PAO and do it all. Try everything that you want to try and, and have fun with it. Because if you're not having fun, what's the point? Oh, exactly. I, so, I think it's the it's it's the best kept secret. I think so too. And it's very interesting to hear your perspective coming from the military and and to kind of draw the parallels that, that that you saw. Talk about some of the challenges. What are some of the differences or things that you didn't expect that that somebody that's coming from the military needs to prepare themselves for that that won't be exactly the same? Yeah, I mean, look. You, you still have to earn your keep here. I think the hard thing for me, I did, you know, I was already, uh, you know, an E6 in the military showing up to the Border Patrol and mm -hmm. e E7 promotable, right? I was getting my E7 and you always have to start back at one, zero, right? You yeah. always get to, that, you get to zero. And so getting to my field training officer, which is so funny, I know he's probably going to be watching this later. He's going to laugh, <laughs> but he was like, Mr. Vargas, I am your NCO now. And I was like, <laughs> oh, man, I got to go back to day one. You know, so now you're back to being the new guy mm -hmm. and earning your keeps and earning that respect. And, you know, I think it's hard for a veteran to to come back from all these hardships and all this leadership and, and high levels of where you were at and then start at the beginning. I would like to tell them, like, it's a good thing. It's a very good thing to to get to the humbling side of it and, and stripping down that ego of what the military sometimes gives us and allowing yourself to learn this job and be the best at it. Right. And so it didn't take long for my FTO to be like, OK, he deserves to be here. He's working his butt off. I had no ego. I learned every single job that I needed and they asked me to. And then I wanted to do more after that. And so it's hard to come back and start back from ground zero. And that for me was definitely hard as well. But if I can tell anyone, like, don't show up with an ego be excited to learn new things and it won't take long for them to welcome you with open arms and be a part of that family. Great advice. Great advice. And of course, what you gravitated towards once you got into Border Patrol was the special operations community. No surprise given your background. And you chose Borstar, the Border Patrol Search, Trauma and Rescue Team. 
also a member of the, of the team myself. Uh, you were class 22? Yes, sir. I was class 3. <laughs> <laughs> you make me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about that. How was that experience for you? Why did you choose Borstar? Yeah. Uh, you know, I felt like what I did for the tactical side of my life, uh, I accomplished everything I could ever ask for. You know, when, you, when you're in a unit like Rangers, um, it's like I said, it's running and gunning. And I we did over 300 plus missions of kicking in doors and doing our job, you know, for the government, whatever it was asked of us. <clears throat> and I felt like it was my time to try and be the medic side of it. You know, I've done some medical on the side already. I was an EMT already when I joined. And so my goal was to be the best medic that Bortac could ever ask for. So if I could be the best shooting medic they can have, well, that's, that's my position now in life. And so when the opportunity presented itself to, to trial for Borstar, I showed up and I thought like, this is going to be cake, man. I've already gone through all kinds of different selections. Mm-hmm. I remember day zero <laughs> being woke up at 4 a.m. And I was almost like a, like a nightmare. I woke up, I was like, oh, okay, what military school is this? Where am I at right now? And then I saw my instructor, I was like, oh, this is Borstar selection? Like, what are they doing? You know, and it didn't stop. The whole 20 something days of just complete devastation. Uh, I'll tell you what, I wasn't sure how, if I respected the special operations in the Border Patrol as much as I would uh, active duty military, but uh, they, they can run toe to toe. The selection was challenging. The selection kicked my butt mentally, physically, emotionally. And I was extremely proud to get through that. Uh, at the age I was, I thought it would have been fine, but it, it beat me up, uh, and it, it chewed me up and spit me out, and, and I was blessed to call myself a four star member after that. Amen. I, I echo everything you just said, uh, and, and then some. So I, I can tell you we have people that ask all the time. You know, the trainees that come through here, they ask, okay, which team would you join? And they ask, what are some tricks of the trade or secrets to help get through? Having gone through it, what's some advice you'd give somebody that's interested in going out for four star? Yeah, you know, um, for Borstar and Bortac, you know, I think the first thing, the hurdle for everyone is a PT test, you know, and I'll tell you what I think a lot of guys do wrong is, you know, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, run, right? Mm -hmm. I think everyone trains it incorrectly. I think they do push-ups one day in the gym, they do sit-ups one day in the gym, they do run one day in the gym, they do pull-ups one day in the gym. This is a triathlon, you know what I mean? You got to do push-ups, then sit-ups, then run, then pull-ups in the order that you're tested as much as possible, or else you're going to be shocked when you show up like, oh, for some reason my legs weren't with me today because you've trained wrong this whole yeah. time. And that's to me is that the biggest thing is the PT test is the first hurdle. If you if you train that wrong, you're going to show up to the PT test and you're going to be spent and you're going to fall mm-hmm. short and you'll question why. And it's only because you did it wrong. The other side is in Borstar is be a good runner, be a good swimmer, and don't quit. You know, And, and there's times when people get injured. And I get it. We don't want to hurt your career for the longevity of it. But if, if it's this thing, right? So so in mine, my knee was hurting. And I told myself, like, man, I, it's to the point where I think it might be a real injury, but I don't know. And I almost I almost said those words. I was actually brought to tears and the PT instructor's yelling at me. He's like, just get on the bus. You're the last one. And I was like, oh, man, he's, he might be right. You know, I started doubting that he yep. might be right. And then something in me was like, no, he's not. I'm good. I got to keep going. And I decided that I was going to run until my knee decided to actually give out. And then I'd finally have an excuse that I can, I can live with, right? Mm-hmm. I Surgery, fine. I'll do it, you know? Yeah. And luckily we ended up getting a couple of days off. My knee was able to, the swelling went down and I was able to pass. But there's those moments that you have to remember why you're there why you chose to be there. And if you have to do that meal by meal by meal or minute by minute by minute, you have to continue to tell yourself this is worth it because the end state goal of being on one of these teams, you're surrounding yourself with individuals that are ready to push themselves at hard, hard lanes to save and rescue and do these missions that that are unheard of. I've seen it close to hand and it was 100% worth it to put myself through all that. I don't know that I've ever heard it put any better than that. And I want to call everybody's attention to the things that you were describing were more mental than physical. It, it's 100%. all about, you said minute by minute. I used to say hour by hour. You just you just get it in your mind that I'm not going to quit. And you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. You saw it. Some of the biggest PT studs out there may not make it. No. 
But you have somebody that just has the heart and the drive and the desire, and they push through and they get it, and that's who you get to work beside whenever you get yeah. on these teams. It's an amazing. Yeah, I went there with a little bit of chubbiness, you know, and I saw some guys with ripped abs. I'm like, oh man, I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was a uh, I think 25 or 26 year old again coming from Oklahoma. And I, I'm looking at Rangers and football players, and I'm like, what am I doing here? I mean, if they yeah. can't make it, how in the world am I going to do it? But just, it's it, very easy to psychologically pull yourself out of the game really fast. Very easy. If you look at everyone, you try and judge that book, uh, you'll be surprised. And the guy you probably didn't think would ever make it has the most heart in the room. Yep. Yeah, and it. Uh, I always say they call them the, the ninjas. Like you'll be there with 50 people and the person beside you and you turn around and they're gone. And you, where'd they go? <laughs> <laughs> they failed some evolution or they quit and you never see them again, right? Next thing yeah. you know, you're down to 20 people. And, and so you're kind of looking over your shoulder, make sure there's, the ninjas are coming after you next, right? Yes. You just never saw them. And there are people that you would train with and, and uh, you know, they were they were very solid. And for whatever day, like you said, maybe they trained wrong. And I remember one guy that uh, that uh, went through with in the pool evolution, the swimming. Yeah. And he, he was never comfortable in the water and he, he gave it his best shot. But he uh, he didn't he, he ended up touching the side and then they pulled him out and I remember him I looked up at him at one point and he was just you know you could tell he was dejected and I never saw him again I mean yeah. he, he was completely gone <laughs> after that till we got back and it just that's a weird phenomenon that everybody goes through the those classes yeah. they talk about how they're one minute and gone the next oh yeah I was an instructor for a couple of years and so I remember guys showing up at like two a.m. like I'm done and you're like mm-hmm. oh okay and the guys wake up in the morning and I'm like you're one down they're like. Oh my goodness! What happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, crazy. So you got through the the selection course, and you found yourself at the special operations group, and it's a much different dynamic than when I was involved. In that, the teams are really integrated; uh, they they work yeah. together very closely. Bortac, Borstar, even MRT and the intelligence side. Mm-hmm. So you found yourself as a medic for the Bortac teams a lot of the times, and going out on search and rescues. Talk a little bit about what the life of the operator in the border patrol is like. Yeah, it's really beautiful to to have this this community of medics and, and tactical guys working together. You know, they knew that my background was ranger. They they knew that I understood the SOPs for for BORTAC because they were actually developed by a ranger. Chris Voss was one of the first guys to help put that together. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it wasn't hard to to identify like who's the medic that's going to be running with 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 BORTAC. And it was a couple of us that were very interested in that world. And, you know, we, you know, we had several ops that were down in McAllen and we were, we were doing the whole thing down there. And, you know, it's day to day. You're running whatever mission is at that time that's needed, whether it be to disrupt, whether it be it, it didn't matter what it was. You know, you were with the team that was highly motivated, crazy in shape and highly skilled. And, you know, at first there was a little bit of blowback from 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 the medic side. You know, they, they never really seen a, a medic in that area want to be so involved. But because of my combat experience and everything else, you know, I was started to, you know, they were giving the tip of the cap and let me get more involved. And, you know, it, it became a really good relationship between uh, Borstar and Bortac at the time in Del Rio sector. You know, the Dirty Birds is what they call themselves. Yep. yep. And, um, you know, and that kind of transitioned into when I got um, brought over. I got laterally transferred over to SOG and, and helped the academy there and then jumped on board with one of the teams in, in Bortec as well. And the rest, as they say, is history. The rest is history. <laughs> so I want to talk about you for a second because then you did something really crazy. You decided to follow your dream and you yeah. uh, you left your green family and in pursuit of this thing that has turned into a, a, a as an artist a career as a as a writer a producer an actor you have your own podcast which i was just joking with you earlier your your uh, studio is a lot more fancy than <laughs> than mine here so man the courage it must have taken i mean there you go i like the green the that's green. better <laughs> talk about it what was the thought process or what was the decision process to to make that leap you know, it was the hardest decision I've ever made in my life. Um, I didn't even talk to my dad about it because he would have said no. Right later on, he told me because you should have talked to him. I was like, no, because you talked me out of it. Um, it was imagine it's it's I had the, I won the lottery with being a Borstar agent on the SOG on the top teams, doing incredible missions and serving my country. But at the same time, I'm going through a lot of personal stuff whether it comes mm-hmm. with post traumatic stress issues that I that I haven't I've ignored. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, family issues, I was going through a second divorce, you know, and these things that it kind of compiled one after the other. And I really wasn't good at telling other people my issues, but I was more like, 
I got to figure it out. I got to figure it out. And I felt myself slowly committing to my family more than the border patrol and having this dichotomy of like what's right and what's wrong. And, and life was hard. It was really mm-hmm. hard for me at the time. And the one thing that was staring me in the face was the success that me and my friends were having on YouTube. It was just doing really well. Mm-hmm. And people were getting a lot of fun out of it. And there was veterans messaging me how, how it's motivating them to to keep going. And, and it's in a time of hardship. They're laughing at these, the humor on these videos. And it really inspired me and, and made me feel like I could probably affect my community in a really great manner if I continue pursuing this. Because my heart was questioning everything when it came to not just the Border Patrol, but being a better father. You know, I, I, I easily am committed to these jobs and I, I almost overcommitted. You know, I wasn't willing to m- miss work for a birthday. I was not willing to. It, my heart would say, that's not fair to my team. I'm their medic, you know. And one point I did make that decision. And that was during the very well-known mission in New York. Yep. I flew home a day before for my daughter's birthday. I have a picture of me holding her and she's in her, her luau outfit and I'm in my hula skirt myself, you know, supporting her in her birthday bash <laughs> that I've never really been at any of her birthdays besides this. And yeah. that was really the choice that made me feel, okay, it's time to, I'm ready to walk away and try this crazy dream of being an actor, right? This. Mm-hmm unheard of thought process like yeah from from nothing to trying you know and i just i just after missing that mission it, it really affected me i told i told chris voss and i said um i'm not giving you my whole heart and it's not fair as a medic it's not fair for the team to to give them the half medic so i i'm gonna walk away and he tried to talk me out of it i said no there's no there's none i know what's in me right now my family is, is needs me um, and I needed to just shift gears for a second. I think I wasn't handling my post-traumatic stress very well and being involved in that world that's very similar to, to Iraq and Afghanistan wasn't helping either. And so there were several reasons I needed to take a step back already. And then the entertainment side was just kind of knocking on my door. And so yeah. it was just a lot of things that made sense to just take the shot. And in, I promise you, 30 days later, I called and said, I think I'm coming back. 60 days, coming back. six months later, I said, I might be coming back. Like, yeah. I, it was such a risk to walk away from a job that I was in the position I've dreamed about, getting paid comfortable money, and then letting it all go for a dream. It was not easy. It's still to this day hard. Mm. But like anything else, like everything I've ever done, you know, I believed in myself. I believed in, in the efforts I've made in special operations communities. I, I want to my approach to acting was the same. Mm. I'm going to train the best. I'm going to train like crazy. I'm going to train more than anyone else. I'm going to put myself out there. I was just talking to to my partner today about, I just believed I could do it. Same way I believed I could be a sports station. Same way I believed I could be a board station. I believed in that, that wholeheartedly, why not me? And um, I started taking strides in that direction. So you had the, you know, the clarity of thought there when you were holding your daughter and you, you saw what needed to be done. And a lot of people get that, but then having the courage to actually take that step and do it. I equate a lot of those decisions in life to rappelling off of a tower for the first time. When you're looking over the edge, it's as scary as scary can be. And you have to have the courage to step over that edge. And then when you're on the wall, it's the most fun you've ever had. As you yeah. start going there, you have to work at it and get better at it. But it's yeah. taking that first leap that is this, the hard part. And there's a lot of folks that never have the courage to actually take that leap. And you did. How much did your background with the Border Patrol and with the military play into that and give you that foundation and that courage to do that? I think it was everything. I think, like I said, if you use the same mindsets of what made me successful in the military, what made me successful in the Border Patrol, and I just took that same mindset and pivoted it towards acting. I mean, my success in acting is because, you know, I put my head down and I train hard, right? It's the same thing my success in board training was that I put my head down and train hard. I, I, I soak up all the information from the senior men above me to the men to the left and right of me. And the same in acting. You know, my first season of Mayans MC, the newest actor on set, the first scene is four of us and three actors, two are uh, critically acclaimed. And I'm like, well, what am I doing? <laughs> but I believed I could compete, right? Mm-hmm. Just like in the room of all these guys trying out for four star, I, I knew I could compete. 
And so, you know, now we're going on to season four here soon. And I, I have that much more confidence that I can compete, you know, and, you know, testament to my board, board, board patrol and board star brothers and sisters is they pushed me the whole way. They were proud They're, you know, I, I still talk to these guys and messaging like, man, they're, they're so proud of what I'm doing. And I continue to, to tip the cap to the border patrol and, and not forget what I'm doing. I'm, I'm a tech advisor on the show and make sure that everything with border patrol is as close to realistic as possible. There's some things I'm not allowed to touch, but anything I do have my hand in, I'm doing my best to make sure it betrays the patrol, uh, honestly, but mm-hmm. sometimes it's dramatic television. So there's sure. things that, yeah. you know, they're going to do for the emotional intent. And so, I still have my foot in, in making sure that my brothers and sisters are, are, are I guess, viewed in, in a good light. Well, and that's a great thing because, you know, five or ten years you know, ago before you, uh, people like you started getting into that mix, still relatively unknown was the Border Patrol. And, and so there was a lot of guesswork, I think, in, in how to portray us whenever that opportunity would come up. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, people, you know, they still call us Border Control. <laughs> yeah. Or my favorite is Customs and Border Patrol. You know, it's, yeah. Yeah. How can you not know the name? That's a, that's a pet peeve of a lot of us, I think. Right. Okay. So when you left and, and took that leap, did you already have something lined up or you just, nope, I'm packing my bag and I'm moving to California. I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be, um, it wouldn't be very smart of me just to, to just drop that paycheck and, and try and figure it out. Mm-hmm. I, um, I made strides in that. I started doing really well in business with, with the company that we were doing. It was starting to get close to matching the paycheck. I mm-hmm. was able to, you know, cut uh, cut out some costs that that I didn't okay. need, and do, I made it happen. At one point, you know, business did really bad. I was selling cars and I was an Uber driver this, at night, and so I. It, it's not like I didn't struggle. I definitely went through my hardships of trying to figure sure. out what was next and how can I keep the lights on in the family. You know, I did some contracting and teaching tactical medical stuff. I, like I said, sold cars. I did Uber. I, I was doing anything I could to just keep moving in the direction of the belief system, becoming an actor, right? Like the dream was that don't stop. I just walked away from this. I'm not going to walk away and come back. I wanted to do it. It was like sure. moving out of the house and not wanting to bow your head back to your dad saying, I'm <laughs> come back. Yep. I'm not coming back. I'm going to make this happen. And so, you know, one thing after another, uh, things started to happen, you know, and, and as they started to happen, just, I was able to pay the bills. I was able to, you know, keep the family happy. Uh, we landed a show for the history channel moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, landed the Mayans MC gig, and it just kind of kept snowballing. And it's still it's still snowballing. We're still growing. We produced another movie last year called Lucy Shimmers and the Prince of Peace, a, a Christian, a faith, faith-based faith film is what they call it. And it, it gave me the opportunity to, to do more acting and, and show more range as an actor because our calling card is our scenes on film, right? Mm-hmm. And so... I'm getting these opportunities and growing and, and the whole time I'm doing this, I'm thinking, how can I, how can I come back to the border patrol or how can I tell their story better? You know, so I'm in the process right now of telling that story. I'm in the process of writing that book and, and enlightening those who don't understand, you know, the dynamics of what we do and, and really somehow don't realize the humanitarian mission that we do. I definitely want to talk about that, but I want to tell you, you know, you have your entire Green family rooting you on. We hope you keep on getting better and better and better. It's awesome to see. And uh, I, I do want to talk about uh, the – I got to ask the question uh, before we go any further. So you, you get this call. How did, how did you get the call for the Mayans? I was in L.A. doing an improv comedy uh, skit called Dads in Parks. And it's mm-hmm. just – we're sitting on a bench. We have kids playing in the background. And we just kind of – we we improv comedy back and forth. And – the first one we did did really well, and so they, they asked us to do it again, and now we're filming these for uh, AMC or one of the big movie companies. They want it as a prequel to their movies. And so what I okay. so we filmed like six or seven of those, and I get a call from a buddy saying, hey, mine's still looking for a couple guys. And I was like, well, I'm in L.A., so send them my pictures. So I sent my headshots. I sent my acting reel. It's kind of like I said, it's our resume as actors. It's mm-hmm. like – you're going for a new job, you need your resume. Well, we need headshots and an acting reel, which mm-hmm. is a film of our acting capabilities and images of different character potential looks. And so we sent those all forward and sent them my movie that I produced with the Range 15, sent them my short film that I made called Long Way Back, which is about a veteran struggling with transition. It's based mm-hmm. off a poem that I wrote. And they called me. They said, can you come in tomorrow? 
was like, holy crap, is this that easy in Hollywood? Is this how it goes? I got is this. This, this, is no, this yeah. is no problem. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and so this is my first audition I've ever done, right? The first movie I produced myself, so I didn't have to audition for it. And the second was uh, I invited for the improv comedy. And so I had to call some friends, ask them, like, the details of what I need to do. One of my, one of my buddies, uh, his name is Steve Howie. He's one of the main characters on the show, Shameless. He, he plays a bartender. The, goes, the, the tall guy. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good buddy of mine. And, uh, you know, he goes, listen, you've been to combat. You better go in there and act like, act like you own the place. And he was just telling me, you know, in more colorful words than that, he's just telling me, don't be afraid of this. Like, mm-hmm. you've done the scary stuff ever. Go in there and just own the place. And you're and like, so, he's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it took someone completely outside of my world to say that for me to be like, oh, yeah. What am I doing? Why am I nervous? So I showed up there and I did my I did my audition. Uh, the lady gave me a big hug. Her name is Wendy O'Brien. She 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 gave me a big old hug and said, "That was great." And I looked at my wife. I said, "I think she tells everyone that." <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I I felt like everyone gets that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we fly home to El Paso. I swear to you, I had seven hundred dollars in my account at the time. Right, we're in between jobs. We're trying to figure it out. They called me back and they need me back in LA the next day. The, the tickets for LA were like 600 bucks. That's so I was like, well, might as well try. Here we go. So it was the, yeah, I had to go do a second audition now in front of Kurt Sutter, the, the creator of Sons of Anarchy, yep. the co-creator of Minds MC. And I'm just remembering Steve's words. I like, think, don't be scared. Dude, you, you've done hard stuff. Hmm. I go in there and I remember my dad drove me there. I kind of blacked out. Like it was almost like Will Ferrell, you know, in the old school, like that's how you debate, you know, yeah. like, blacked out. Like what happened? Um, they're all laughing. I'm laughing. I shook their hands. I walk out of there. My dad's like jumping on my back. Like, how was it? You know, like, was, was this so cool? This is a cool experience for me to just be there with you. And I'm like hugging him. And Kurt Sutter was watching from the balcony and said like, man, that's, that's cool. I get the call within the next couple of hours that I start in four days. Wow. Boom. I'm in Hollywood. Like and it's done. You're an actor. Big time. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> what? So crazy. So it, what an experience. Wow. Genuinely the beginning, uh, you know, of, of a complete shift in my lifestyle. And so you you get that. I mean, you had to be riding a high for for days after that. And yeah. you get so we, let's fast forward now and you get to the set. I'm I'm living vicariously through you right now. This is <laughs> this is amazing. So you you get to the set. And all of a sudden, I got to think you're probably surrounded by people you've seen on TV before at this point. Yeah, this is, I mean, I'm standing there next to a guy named Richard Cabral, who plays Coco, who I've watched in movies. My mother's like, he's such a great actor. You know what I mean? <laughs> all these things, right? I see a guy named, uh, you know, he plays Marcus Alvarez. His name is Emilio. I, I know who you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So Emilio is one of the just best people I've ever met in my life. And it's just intimidating just to just say hi to him. But, you know, I'm playing the tough guy. I'm playing the I've been here, done that kind of persona, thinking, like, don't show them you're new and you're, like, giddy, giddy, excited. Mm. <laughs> so I was just trying to fit in. I was trying to, you know, not be too excited about it. But, you know, it's an exciting process. It's yeah. scary as all hell, right? You're just like, what am I doing here? And like I said, the first scene happened. I had my line ready, and I remember they said action. And then Richard Cabral says his line, and I was like, I, I swear, my mouth was open, like, oh, like this is so good. <laughs> I just froze. I was like, oh man, they're so good at this, right? And so they said, yeah, they're like, cut. they're like, uh, Rocco, you good? I was like, yeah. sorry about that. We'll do it again. And then we went and I did my lines, but I remember walking away like, wow. There's a rookie move right there because I was completely in in awe of the switch of of being there with them, talking to them, and then boom, the switch is on. And it reminded me, it, it goes hand in hand with entering, clearing a room in the military. It goes hand in hand with doing a rescue, you know, and, and doing a, a swift water rescue with Borstar. And there's a switch. We're joking in the car, we're laughing, and all of a sudden, like it's game time. And that mm-hmm. game time switch. I didn't have at the moment. I, I didn't realize it needed to be there. You know what I mean? I felt like, oh. And I saw them have the switch, and I was like, okay, I got this. I get it now. And so after that, you were you were good to go and locked on. Yeah, now to me, I, every scene that I'm in, it, it's to me, it's a battle. It's a fight, and, and whoever comes with the best, you know, stuff wins. And 
and it has to be, and that's why I think our show has done so well is that the 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 intent of every actor is to just do their best and and we're all trying to complement each other with that. And so that competitive nature in us mm-hmm. wants to push the other actor to go harder and go harder. And so if you guys got to see the last season, I mean, we went so hard. It was mm-hmm. just incredible to to experience emotionally drawing. Um, and, you know, I just think like that is what has been therapeutic and that has been my new adrenaline dump that I miss so much from, from my old days is going into that room and trying to just outshine the actor in front of you while they're doing it to you. It's, it's the best feeling in the world. That's absolutely awesome. So what was it like the first time you saw yourself on TV? So the thing's all done and, you, and you're sitting down there and you're waiting for that episode to come out. What, what was that like? I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. I'm like, oh, I'm so fat. Oh, look at me. I'm this and that. You know, like you pick a part. You pick it apart. You, you hate it. I feel like I sound like a fool. All these things. And it's just, you know, we're all our own. We're the hardest critics of ourselves, you know. And um, But, you know, the kids enjoy it, right? My wife enjoys it. My family texts me and just says they're so proud. And so... You know, I think I'm always going to be tough myself. I always want to be better. I'm, I've always been that type of person that wants to just continue to to grow. And so I continue to, crit- to critique myself very hard. But there's the cool moment of, like, my brother or someone from the military, someone from the board patrol saying, like, bro, so good. You know, and so that to me, <laughs> that, that's the payoff. That's awesome. I mean, just, what an amazing story. It, you know, and for all, I think we can look back and laugh at our goofs more than we can anything else. Oh, they, yeah, those, need to. they make the best stories, right? Yeah. So I, I, I try and wrap my head. I, I told you I was looking at your at your website and some of your of your bio, and, and I want to kind of take everybody through it real quick. So as a writer, you know, you wrote The Long Way Back. You wrote uh, the TV series and episodes of Dads in Parks. You acted in Dark of Light. You acted in, in The Long Way Back. You acted in Range 15. You produced Range 15. You're also a stuntman. You did The Long Way Back, stunts in The Long Way Back. And, of course, the Mayans. And you just mentioned the movie uh, Lucy Shimmers and, and, and Prince Peace. The Prince Peace, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I, for somebody like me, that, that artistic gene just doesn't exist. And I'm trying to think uh-huh. about <laughs> what it takes to be, you know, improv comedy and, and, to, and to actually write stories and movies and the satisfaction that must come with seeing a product like that come to fruition and, and what it does for people. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff I've done and created, it has a message, you know, I, it, if, if it doesn't have a message, if it, you know, besides Minds MC and Minds MC has its own undertones, right. It has its own messaging mm-hmm. and it's not my creation. I'm just an actor in that, but I try to portray that whatever message they want and the best of my ability, but anything that I've either written or produced myself, you know, it has to align with some kind of messaging that to me is valuable at, at that time, right? Mm-hmm. When I did Range 15, at that time, that comedy, that dark humor was valuable, right? At that time, I think it was a, it was another, this is for the community. Let's make some dark humor because we all kind of thrived off of dark humor because of all the hardships we sure. faced. And, and, and it's kind of what we, we kind of, it was a way of, this rudimentary communication between guys who just didn't want to be open to their own emotions. It was just like, well, this works better. <laughs> well, know, and so- that's something, I'm sorry, but that, that's something that uh, if you haven't been in these situations, there's a, there's a therapeutic aspect to that type of humor and that type of yeah, interaction. I mean, if you've ever been in an ER room, if you've ever been, you know, around paramedics, if you've ever been around, you know, hospice nurses, they, you know, there's all there's a way to diffuse that stress in, in a manner. And sometimes comedy is that that choice. Mm-hmm. And so when we made Range 15. We really made a, a conscious decision to make very, very over the top dark humor for the community. We really wanted to do that. We wanted to be borderline edgy. As I've grown as a person, as I've grown in my own healing and, and directions in life, I, I pivoted a little bit and I wanted to tell the more heartfelt story of struggling with post-traumatic stress, right? And so I did a long way back. Uh, and then, you know, just recently, the Lucy Shimmers and the Prince of Peace, you know, me, me and my partner, you know, the writer and the director of that film and, and the main producer of that film, you know, the reason I did that film was because it was, you know, everyone has deserved second chances, right? It's the second chance things change, you know, mentalities change. We can grow. And the character I played, he had to shift his mindset and, and 
that was important in his own healing. And so, you know, in everything I have, I have several documentaries coming out. That's me tell the story of the veteran the veterans and, and their sacrifices and, and in a very visceral way, because I think it deserves to be told in a very raw manner. It's the only way I think the American community can, can actually understand the sacrifices that are made daily, yeah. you know, and as I work on the border patrol story, it would be the same, right? Mm-hmm. The border patrol story is a tough one though. I want to tell that story in the most humanistic way because for some reason, you know, in recent years through media and through political agenda, you know, uh, swaying left and right, doesn't matter which way you want to sway it. I'm saying it's being used in a manner that's not fair, in my opinion, right? Mm-hmm. This is coming from Vince Vargas' opinion, not the not the opinion of anyone else. But the point is that um, – it's very important for us to tell our own story, to tell our own viewpoints in a manner that can be digested by those who don't fully understand immigration, mm-hmm. that fully don't understand the job, right? And fully don't understand that it's human beings doing a job that's very, very human and raw and, and making choices to rescue and save more lives than almost any other agency in the world. And so I want, I, I, I feel like it's my job to tell that story. I feel like I'm in a position now that people are listening and I'm not talking lefts or rights or anything other than the honest middle of the men and women who serve daily to protect, you know, the, the, to protect America, to, to, to disrupt drug trafficking, human trafficking, all these things that we deal with in a day-to-day job that the rest of the world doesn't really know. And when I say like something they can digest, I just don't think it, the story is told in a way where everyone could fully understand what we do. And doesn't it seem like it ought to be so very easy for us? It, all we have to do, in my opinion, is to be just objective and transparent, you know, bear ourselves for, uh, for the world to see, and that story will tell itself. Yeah, and, and when you take in the opinion of what our job is at a border patrol by a news source for me it's like you have to be able to identify whether that is you know if there's an agenda behind it in my opinion i think just go to the source right sure. like you want to know what the border patrol does for a day ask a border patrol yeah ask a border <laughs> agent i'll tell you right now it's it's i'm gonna i'm before my shift I make sure that there's a little bit of extra food in my in my in my lunchbox for just in case, and I always make sure that there's cold water in my in my cooler for just in case. And if I pull up on some IAs that are out there that are dehydrating, because in the in the summer of Texas we lose so many IAs to due to dehydration. It's one of the saddest things you'll ever see, but you don't get to hear about. But we prepare our trucks daily for that engagement. Yeah. Like if this is going to happen, we want to make sure that we have water. Sometimes you give. You know, it, it's just this interesting thing that, you know, um, I wish more people understood. I do. Too. And then, and then immigration as a whole is such. A, I, I like to say it's a seven layer cake. There's so many different levels to this that, that in the end of the day, we do the job that is put into by Congress, and we just do exactly what is what we're supposed to. That's yeah. that's the job. And you kind of alluded to it earlier, and it. The immigration aspect is just one piece of what a Border Patrol agent does in the mission of border security and national security. There's a lot of uh, bad things and bad people that, that you want uh, kept from getting into our communities and everything. And it's it's not just about the people that are coming across looking for a better way of life. And and because of the nature of our job, yeah, we, we encounter those people. We're usually the first face they see when they, when they, when they come to the country. And we usually are there with food and water uh, and, and getting them out of a situation that is that the smugglers live left them in. They cross They cross in these areas that, quite frankly, human beings are not meant to be, some of the most austere conditions in the uh, in the country. And that's the part that I wish, you know, like you, I wish people could see the agents through my eyes and the things that I see yeah. that they do every single day. Yeah, I, I, I wish the same thing. I'd like to see someday for that to be the case. And, and I do believe that if the people just saw the objective facts of what went on every day by these men and women that put on this uniform, we wouldn't have to worry about any ulterior motives and win on the day because we would win people over. I, I agree. I understand. Agree. And hopefully, you know, I can be uh, some kind of assistance to that messaging. 
Well, and, and you're, of course, part of this Green family forever and always. And, and I, I mentioned before, you know, we uh, we were rooting you on. You know, it's, it's, it's awesome to see you being as successful. And, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's cool to look at the uh, – watch the show and say – I know that guy, you know, <laughs> that's really, really cool. But then, of course, we would take you back in a heartbeat. I mean, it's it's, it's one of those things where uh, it's bittersweet either way you go. So when you, uh, you talked about what it was like being an agent, being a trainee, one of the things that uh, we instill in trainees today is – our motto and our guiding principle, which is honor first. And that is something that, uh, you know, just like they start going through the curriculum whenever they're, uh, you know, at the academy, they also start learning why are they a border patrol agent and are they doing it for the right reason? Are they making the right decisions? Are they living honor first on and off duty? And for everybody that's ever put on this uniform, those two little words carry a very deep, heartfelt meaning. Tell us a little bit about what that means for you. Honor first to me, man, I, I think it, it boils down to, if I, if I have to strip down all the layers of honor first, it's integrity. It's integrity of knowing the job. It's integrity of knowing that you're going to be doing the right thing at all times, even when no one's looking. Sometimes it's just you out there, and you got to make that decision. Honor first is, I carry the, you know, I carry the legacy of Border Patrol my, on my own, as much as we all do carry that on our shoulders and want to continue to to bring a good light to that. Meaning we're humans and we're making human decisions daily. And honor first to me is always having the integrity of making the right choice. Well said. I, I think that's and I tell the trainees when I talk to them that uh, you have to decide what those two little words mean for you, but they have to mean something because otherwise when you say it, what are you actually saying? If you haven't given thought to it and it doesn't have a, a meaning behind it, then when you say them, you're not saying anything. And it's not about having a paragraph that you write down and, and have them memorize and recite on demand. That's not a guiding principle. That's an exercise in memory. Those two little words for us, they belong to everybody that's ever worn that uniform, and they have to give that thought. And you said something earlier about how over time as you mature and your experience develops, you change your perspectives and yeah. I think so does your definition of your guiding principle and what guides you. Oh, for sure. We're, we're forever evolving. And, and as I got into the Border Patrol originally and I, and I left there, I left there with a whole different mindset of it. I mean, when you do rescues, and I did a rescue one time in Garisol, which uh, water, swift water rescue. And I remember this giant of a man standing on his truck that was about to get flooded off. And I go out to reach for him. And he gives me the biggest hug. And that was like in tears of thank you, thank you for, for saving me, I was like, man, there's something so special about what we're doing here. You know what I mean? And it's yeah. not only IAs, it's anyone within the border areas, right? Yeah. And so those moments it, it stick with me forever and, and, you know, feeling really good about the job and really good about what we do. And it, just that hug, he didn't care who I was. I was the first person there, you know, didn't matter race, didn't matter what agency, nothing. It was the fact that I was there. And how do you describe that feeling to somebody that wasn't there? How do you go home at the end of the day and tell your wife, you're not going to believe what this was? You can, you can tell the story, but what you felt in that moment, how do you describe that? It's impossible. They'll you, never understand that, that, that. I felt the gratitude through his hug. And that's, the, that's why we do what we do. That's why all first responders, all military, all law enforcement, that higher calling, that, that sense of satisfaction at accomplishing something larger than ourselves. I don't know how you put that in words. I've been, I've been doing this 25 years and I still can't, I still can't figure it out. It, but it, I know why we do it. And I, and I know it when I see it, when I feel it, and it, it's what keeps us all going. I, I just, uh, I tell the trainees, I say, look, whenever you, uh, uh, as you go through this training, I tell you it's worth it. There's no way I can describe the adventure and the family that awaits you on the other side of this. If you have what it takes to stick it out and make it through you're a testament to that in every way, shape, or form. I mean, it's we're, we're proud of you, and uh, we we hope that you continue to ex, uh, to succeed, and we hope you never forget your green family whenever you're whenever you're a, a top Hollywood actor. But <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I know uh, that calling still comes back to you sometimes, and, and you know, uh, the the green family would always take you back in, in a heartbeat, and uh, and we're always here cheering you on in your corner. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. For those trainees that are going through the academy right now, for the men and women that are out there on patrol, any words of wisdom or advice 
looking in from the outside now and, and seeing what they're going through, what would you tell them if you had them in front of you? Stay in the fight. Stay in the fight. I know it's not easy. You know, I know, uh, you know, media and social media tries to portray a different message, but we all know the truth. We know what we do. We are, we are humans doing a human job, and, and, and the root of it, it all comes from, from good intentions. And I'm proud of every single one of you doing it daily. I'm proud of every single one of you, uh, you know, wearing that hardship on your shoulders and continuing to do the mission. And, and there's millions of us that support you in your job. Great words. Vince Rocco Vargas from the Mayans MC and a whole host of other things. My brother, thanks for being on here and talking to us today. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you. And that's going to do it for another episode of What's Important Now, ladies and gentlemen. We'll talk again soon on our first.